Hello everyone and welcome back to the Nuclear Humanist. Nuclear energy is incredible. We take a handful of fuel and we can generate enough energy for an entire city in a year. Splitting the atom has proven to be the most efficient way to get electricity and heat. And that's from all different viewpoints. In terms of feedstock and in terms of materials required to build a reactor facility. And in terms of productivity per person involved. Naturally, there are regulations which can make nuclear expensive. But this doesn't mean that the technology is inherently expensive. It's what we call artificial pricing. Just as you see in the healthcare in the US, for instance. I am confident that we will see the necessity of a nuclear expansion in the West eventually. In the meanwhile, China, Russia, India and half a dozen other countries keep investing in nuclear reactors. Aside from that, we are now seeing developments which will decrease the cost of nuclear energy even further by reducing complexity in both the production of fuel and the reactor and the facilities itself. One technology in particular will eventually break the ice for nuclear in the traditional West, and that's the molten salt reactor. Luckily, there are now two contenders to first build the third real molten salt reactor since the 1960s. And those are terrestrial energy and Thorcon power. Do note that I say third on purpose. The first two were built and operated in Oak Ridge, Tennessee back in the 60s. The aircraft reactor experiment and the molten salt reactor experiment. In the meanwhile, a lot of different but equally interesting proposals are being made, including fast metal breeder reactors, pebble bed reactors, both helium as well as molten salt cooled, small modular reactors, and so on. All very interesting, all very promising, and all worth pursuing with great determination. And do note that it is absolutely necessary to include all of these technologies in a future energy portfolio as we are now edging dangerously close to the IPCC 1.5 to 2 degree scenario. There is absolutely no valid argument to suppose that leaving out nuclear will be beneficial to achieve deep decarbonization. People try to argue that price and build speed are an argument, but when you look at the sheer volume of energy required, discounting anything that is low carbon at this moment is sheer folly. But we have to be smart, because something can be said for the looming electric waste problem of solar panels, for instance, which is not only very large in volume, but also poses true hazards to the people who live on the dumps where this electric waste ends up and gets separated by means of menial labor. We are talking about people getting systematically exposed to dangerous elements like lead, chromium and cadmium. For more information, check out this video by Jemin Desai and Mark Nelson of Environmental Progress. We have to set stringent rules for the solar industry too, so that they, like the nuclear industry, assume full responsibility for its product, cradle to cradle. Apart from combating climate change, these new reactor principles will spur innovation and development of new technologies which can help us in many ways. One of which is to make more efficient use of what people call nuclear waste, particularly spent nuclear fuel. For some reason, people are freaked out about nuclear waste and spent nuclear fuel. The question is, is this rational? Is this even justified? Let's see what we can find out. Let's consider these questions first. What is nuclear fuel? What happens during fission? And how much nuclear fuel do we use? Let's answer these questions. Most of all, contemporary light water reactors run on solid fuel pellets which are made of 96% uranium-238 and 4% uranium-235. We call this low enriched uranium. High enriched uranium contains a very high percentage of uranium-235. This kind of uranium is used in high flux reactors to do material research and create valuable life-saving isotopes. The high flux reactor in Patton is one of these invaluable reactors. So when we want to make electricity, low enriched uranium will suffice. 
when we want to create energy from these fuel pellets, we combine them in a fuel bundle and submerge them in water in a reactor vessel. We introduce neutrons from a so-called startup source, which will help the first fission reactions to occur and help the reactor reach criticality. Criticality is the term we use for a sustained and controlled chain reaction of fissions. Only the uranium-235 atoms are fissionable. Once the uranium-235 isotope absorbs a neutron, it becomes so unstable that it will break apart into two fission products, two or more neutrons and the energy we need. Usually, we keep low enriched fuel in the reactor for about five years. During these five years, about 3% of the energy contained in the original fuel pellet has been extracted. The fuel pellet has remained the same for about 94%. During these five years, 6% of the fuel pellet has changed in composition. A small part has become transuranics, for instance plutonium and neptunium. And most of it has become fission products, of which there is a great variety of different atoms and isotopes. Most importantly, it is very small in overall volume and it is quite easy to manage as it remains a solid and doesn't change all that much from its original composition and geometry. Some of these fission products like xenon absorb neutrons but don't fission. This messes up the neutron economy which means the amount of neutrons available to sustain the chain reaction. And that's one of the reasons why the fuel pellet has become unsuitable for further utilization. Another reason to get the fuel assembly out is because the fuel pellets have now changed thanks to the accumulation of gases inside the pellet. So it now takes up more volume. So how much nuclear fuel has been used for so far? And how much of it exists? If you have watched my Great Pyramid equivalent video, you already know the answer. So basically, the total volume of all the uranium on the planet is about one-eighth of the volume of the Great Pyramid. And yet it is enough to supply mankind with energy for millennia to come. Also note that we can use another radioactive isotope called thorium which can stretch our energy prosperity to millions upon millions of years. Well enough time to figure out where else to get fuel for either nuclear fission or nuclear fusion. More importantly, it allows us to do so while raising the energy prosperity for humans all over the planet and leave no one behind. Now we have a clear understanding how we get spent nuclear fuel. There are now two options. We can store it or we can reprocess it. In either case, we do not need to bury it because spent nuclear fuel offers golden opportunities. Let's check how we store the spent nuclear fuel. Storing it happens in two stages. First, it will be inserted in a spent fuel pool where it can stay for decades. This is a pool filled with demineralized water in which the fuel assemblies containing the spent fuel are stored temporarily. The water shields and cools the spent fuel and keeps the radiation that emanates from it contained. If the spent fuel pool starts to fill up, we can move the fuel to dry cask storage containers. So what's a dry cost storage container? It's a simple steel cylinder that holds the fuel bundle, which is subsequently encased in a thick concrete cylinder. This storage container has been designed to remove the remaining decay heat passively and contain all the radiation. The fuel assemblies are loaded in a so-called basket in a steel cylinder filled with an inert gas like argon. And this steel cylinder is not directly encased by concrete, but by a layer of air that sits between the steel cylinder and the concrete cylinder. Through natural convection, this air cools the cylinder to remove the decay heat from the fission products. 
there are a couple of designs for dry cask storage containers. Benefits of this kind of storage is that it is completely passive. It makes keeping and maintaining spent nuclear fuel easy. We can replace them when needed. And more importantly, it makes the spent nuclear fuel easily retrievable for use in new reactors. There are only a couple of thousand dry cask fuel containers on the entire planet. These are well maintained and routinely checked. And there is less than 500 spent fuel pools on the planet, all of which are very robust encased in steel liners and meters thick concrete. Both the spent fuel pool and the dry storage casks are routinely checked by experts who have been trained to do so. The thing to take away here is that there has never been a leakage of any radiation that would not somehow register above background levels. Aside from that, the only possible radiation that could with an exceedingly low probability exit spent fuel containers is either a gamma ray or a neutron, which in any case is dwarfed by cosmic radiation and radiation from natural sources such as the ubiquitous potassium-40. We have no records of any deaths associated with spent nuclear fuel. All there is to it is a lot of political debate and populist attention-grabbing scaremongering. That's all there is. There's all this hoopla about spent nuclear fuel, which in effect is a total non-issue. Spent nuclear fuel just sits idly in these ponds and casks, and nothing remotely dangerous will ever happen. We've now learned a great deal about spent nuclear fuel, and should feel more confident about it. Let's consider some additional facts. Perhaps I can convince you to check these out for yourself, and like me, change your mind on nuclear energy, if you haven't already. The transuranics contained in spent nuclear fuel are subject of discussion. Some people like to believe that these are a liability. However, these can be considered as fuel for newer reactors. Alongside the uranium-238, we can extract hundreds of thousands of terawatt hours from all the spent fuel and the transuranics contained within them. For instance, people at Elysium Industries are developing a molten chloride fast breed reactor for this exact purpose. These reactors could be used to transform spent nuclear fuel and perhaps even plutonium from bombs into energy. This offers us a double-edged sword, which will help us to diminish the spent nuclear fuel problem and the threat of nuclear weapons. In the meanwhile, liquid-fueled reactors can help us extract valuable fission products during operation, not only ensuring optimal performance, but also adding additional value to the whole spent nuclear fuel issue. We may think about elements such as neodymium, molybdenum, technetium, bismuth, etc. However, we will never find out unless we get these reactors going and involve chemists like Stephen Boyd, who are very keen on learning more about nuclear chemistry and helping to mature the technology. All of this can be said for depleted uranium too. We are left with depleted uranium after we have enriched nuclear fuel. There are plenty of reactors which are being designed to consume depleted uranium as well. We have massive stocks of depleted uranium, for instance at Paducah in Kentucky, a storehouse with more worth than Fort Knox when the remediation of carbon emissions and hazardous air pollution are concerned. Only the short-sighted stare themselves blind on remote possibilities of small and meaningless accidents, while scientists and nuclear physicists from all over the world acknowledge the great good contained in these nuclear repositories. A final note about safety. We have had the Three Mile Island, Chernobyl and Fukushima accidents. We now know that these events have caused almost no deaths to speak of, 
and can't even be compared to wind and solar workers who die on the job or the hundreds of millions of people who have died from the effects of air pollution since the Industrial Revolution. There is almost no activity to speak of around spent nuclear fuel. There has never been an accident involving spent nuclear fuel which caused any harm. Extensive modeling and research has been performed. The risks are known and very small and are being addressed continuously. This is an ongoing process of improvement and excellence. So in all honesty, stop making such a fuss about spent nuclear fuel. Before we reach the end, I want to thank two people. First, Eric Sundell for his patronage, because I forgot to add him in the credits of the previous videos. And secondly, Jaro Franta, who has helped me put this video together. If you have any subject you want me to make a video on, send me a message and I will consider it. If you like this video, click the thumbs up button. If you want to stay up to date, subscribe. I want to thank you all and in particularly my patrons for making these videos possible. Thank you all for watching.